everyone, my name is John Runyons and I'm a professor of cell and molecular biology at Oxford Brookes University. At Oxford Brookes, we have a brand new building that we call the Advanced Bioimaging Centre and that's what I want to tell you about today. So Brookes is pretty famous for bioimaging. We've got a lot of really big microscopes, laser microscopes and electron microscopes. But before I tell you about those, I hear you asking, bioimaging? What does he even mean? Bioimaging just means the study of biological samples using microscopes. These could be microscopes like the small microscopes you used on the lab bench in school to study sections of material on glass slides, but our microscopes go well above and beyond that. At Brooks, we use microscopes in our research, of course, but we also do our utmost to make sure that students at all year levels use the microscopes. When you come in in first year, you're in a relatively big class size. We use microscopes in the teaching lab, but when you get to second and third year, you get into modules where you actually have the opportunity to get your hands on the big microscopes that I'm going to show you now. Uh, in my career, uh, I've been using microscopes for over 30 years and I've used them to study almost everything from, from plant development and plant evolutionary biology to, lately, cancer cell biology. I'm studying how cancer cells divide. Uh, it is my contention that it just doesn't matter what you're studying in biology. If you know how to use a microscope and you have access to them, you can discover all sorts. So, um, learning microscopy will see you go far in your career. Uh, the first kind of microscope I want to tell you about is called a laser scanning confocal microscope. In the picture that I'm showing you here, Dr. Joe McKenna, one of our bioimaging specialists, is using uh, the granddaddy of all of our laser microscopes. This is the Zeiss 880 confocal scanning microscope. These microscopes are absolutely amazing, like, like the little microscopes you had on the bench uh, in school, but with all of the bells and whistles added on top of that. They let us look right into cells. If we've labeled the organelles that are inside of cells properly, we can see all of them moving around and interacting with each other, doing what they do in life, and we can see them in full living color. Uh, why not a pop quiz? Do you remember the organelles that are inside of cells? I hear you shout out mitochondria right away. That's the one that I call the M word. Whenever I have an open day or an applicant day and I ask the students and the parents, do you remember the organelles? Somebody shouts out mitochondria right away. There are lots of others. The nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the plasma membrane. It's all starting to come back now, isn't it? In the movie I'm showing you right here, we've got an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum labeled with a green fluorescent protein. This protein was discovered originally in the jellyfish, but it's used now to label organelles in all sorts of different animals and plants, and, and it lets us study like never before organelle behavior, organelle movement. This has caused a complete revolution in the science of cell biology, and it's why more and more importance is being given to bioimaging centers like the ones at Oxford Brookes today. As well as looking at the living cell and recording time-lapse movies, the confocal microscope lets us cut what we call optical sections down through a specimen. This is completely non-invasive, doesn't damage the specimen at all. So while the cells are alive and doing their thing, we can make a 3D reconstruction. And in this image here, we're looking at a 3D reconstruction of a small part of a leaf that lets us see the endoplasmic reticulum. And if you look really carefully, the little tiny red dots are the Golgi bodies that move around on the ER. Uh, at the same time, we can do things like going inside of seeds. And, and this movie that I'm showing you now is a rotating seed. We're looking at a median section of it so we can see the little embryo, the little yellow structure that's developing inside of it. There's nothing like being able to see the 3D specimen that's been created from the small two-dimensional images because it really, really helps you get your head around what's going on inside of tissues. We use the confocal microscopes at Brooks to study a whole range of different organisms and cell types. Uh, in this image here, we're studying mammalian cells. These are human cells that have been stained using a technique called immunofluorescence where we use antibody labeling and bright bright fluorescent stains to show up those same organelles inside of cells that I was telling you about a while ago. In this case here, 
the Golgi apparatus is marked in red, the nucleus is marked in blue, and the actin cytoskeleton is marked in yellow. In another example, we've used this to look at dividing cells. So these are, again, human cells in culture. Do you remember the stages of mitosis, of cell division? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase? All of the cells around the outside in this picture are in interphase. They're just resting, and that's what the majority of the cells in your body are doing at the moment. But every now and then a cell has to divide, and it goes into mitosis. And the nuclei that are colored pink in the middle are actually the chromosomes of a cell that's just at the late anaphase or early telophase stage of cell division. And the bright green structure are the microtubules that form the spindle apparatus that help the chromosomes move to the opposite poles before the cells are finally separate daughter cells. We can study the development of organisms, and here is an example of something that's very exciting research at Oxford Brookes University, um, studying the insect eye, and in particular how it develops and what genes there are that control insect eye development. You might ask, what do we care about how a fly's eye develops? Well, the point is, the underlying study is genetics. We use the fruit fly as a model organism to study development of our own eyes. We're all related on the evolutionary time scale, and that means that if we can figure out what genes go wrong when a drosophila, uh, sorry, when a fruit fly's eye doesn't work, that means that we can go looking for that same gene in human eye development and, and perhaps fix it, and that would be our goal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been a plant cell biologist for most of my career, and we can use the confocal microscope to study the effects of different genes in plants, just like we can in animals. In this picture here, we're looking at all of the different cells that make up a stem, and, and, and we know from doing this kind of microscopy down through the decades that um, there are lots and lots of different cell types in there. Some of them conduct water, some of them store sugars and things like that. Also in our Advanced Bioimaging Center, we have the electron microscope. So the confocal laser microscopes that I just told you about are my real specialty, and they're on one side of the hallway. On the other side of the hallway, we have the electron microscopes. Now, I started out my career as an electron microscopist, but I very seldom get to cross that hallway anymore. The people that run this center are now the world experts in electron microscopy, and they sort of frown when I walk into the room, but I feel like I'm still qualified to tell you about it anyway. The electron microscope, in this case, the transmission electron microscope, is a machine that doesn't let us study living cells like you can do with the confocal microscope, but what it does do is it lets us study cells at absolutely the highest magnification possible. We can look right down inside of cells and we can start to see the structure of membranes, something that you couldn't do with those laser microscopes that let you look at cells when they're still alive. So there's a trade-off here. In this image here, we're looking at the Golgi apparatus and, and we're studying the way that it connects with the endoplasmic reticulum. The point of that is to understand how proteins are, are moved through the cell once they're produced. Uh, if we go into even higher magnification, we'd be able to see the ribosomes and people that become really, really accomplished with the biggest transmission electron microscopes can look right down these days and see individual macromolecules. You can see the individual proteins. You can see the individual nucleic acids like DNA. It's absolutely incredible. This picture here is the same sort of thing that I was showing you in the black and white image before. In this case, the different organelles have been colored in so that we can see the transport vesicles that are budding from the Golgi apparatus and delivering proteins and, and sugars and lipids around in the cell. Uh, and finally, and, and this is appropriate given that we're all living in a coronavirus world at the moment, we can use the electron microscope to study the biology of viruses. And these viruses here are imaged at relatively low resolution, but these are some of the tiniest things on Earth, and we can go in and we can deduce their structure using the microscope like this.
Of course, there's a second category of electron microscope, and this one is called the scanning electron microscope. It's different from the transmission electron microscope in that it doesn't let you look inside of cells. We can't see the internal membranes and things like that, but what we can do is we can image the surfaces of structures at very, very high magnification. Now, this is wondrous. If you go back and think about the history of microscopy, pioneers, the people that first started looking through lenses, looked down, they discovered a whole universe of organisms swimming around in a drop of pond water. Nowadays, we can go in at incredibly high magnification, and the beauty of these microscopic structures is absolutely astounding. There's a picture of Jake, one of our technicians, sitting at our scanning electron microscope, and we can use this microscope to look at things like pollen in this example here. Look at the beautiful, beautiful surface structure of these pollen grains. I get fascinated. I love to tell people about the beauty of the images that are producible with the scanning electron microscope, but of course, we learn a lot about organisms as well. Looking at these insects here, for example, we can see their eye development. We can see the sensory organs that are developing on them. Uh, and I love this picture of a flea here. I mean, that's sort of grisly, isn't it, to think that that's the thing that might be feeding on you or your pet at the moment. No, sorry I said that. But this is the thing that the father of microscopy, Robert Hooke, first drew when he looked through his microscope. And look at the detail in the structure of the flea. Or we can go right down. We can fracture open cells and tissues. And we can study, for example, in this picture here, the structure of the retina. And look at all of the different photoreceptors that reside within there. I've just told you about two kinds of electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. Quite different animals, really, because they do, they accomplish different things. There's a new kind of microscopy, and this is the three-view Merlin system that we've got at Oxford Brooks now, and this is an absolutely fabulous machine. It does something that electron microscopes before couldn't do. The transmission electron microscope could make a high magnification image of a very, very thinly sliced piece of tissue so it couldn't do the same as the laser microscopes did it couldn't give us a three-dimensional view of the structure at all this new microscope allows us to image individual sections but step down through the specimen and the microscope works overnight to accomplish this and it produces what we call 3D data sets that we can go in to highlight the different organelles. This picture here of a single cell has different organelles color coded, the nucleus in yellow, the mitochondria in purple, the Golgi bodies in green, and the endoplasmic reticulum in the cyan color. So for the first time now, just in the last few years, we're able to look at cells at incredibly high magnification and in 3D so we can study how the organelles go together. In this movie here, we're using this 3D electron microscopy technique to go down through blood parasites that are called trypanosomes. And in the black and white part of the movie at the start, you see the very, very thin sections through each trypanosome. But then we've used software to build up the individual images into the 3D representation of this parasite. And then we've stripped away its outer surface so that you can see all of the organelles inside of it. And that feeds directly into the research done at Brooks on stopping diseases like malaria and sleeping sickness that are caused by these organisms. So that's really all I wanted to tell you about today. I hope you've enjoyed this brief little tour of the Brooks Advanced Bioimaging Facility. Remember, no matter what your area of research, you can learn so much about cells and organisms by looking through a microscope. Students at Oxford Brookes University have the opportunity to use these microscope systems and in particular if you're watching this video as a prospective first year student, when you come to Brookes we will get you doing hands-on microscope work. You've really got to hold out for the third year project. That's the thing that I tell everybody is the most exciting. When you get to third year in biological or biomedical sciences, you will have the opportunity to do some research right in somebody's lab alongside a professor like maybe myself uh, and you'll 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 sit at the microscopes and you'll make original discoveries and I have absolutely amazing discoveries coming out of our third year undergraduate students every year so again thank you very much and I, I really hope to see some of you as first-year students in September okay bye bye